Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Milkweed is a monarch butterfly favorite. Today we're going to show you how to collect the seeds and plant them. Also, iris are a garden favorite. That's just ahead on the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Jesse Munson. Jesse is the Plant Activities Coordinator here at Lichterman Nature Center, and Joel and Diamond will be joining me later. Hi, Jesse. Hi, Chris. How are you doing? Good. How are good. you? I'm doing good. We're glad that you're here with us today. I'm very glad right. to be here. We're in your setting. Yes. Right? This is I, your setting. my favorite place to be. Your favorite place to be. Well, yeah. look, we're going to learn from you about milkweed. All right. So what are you going to tell us? Well, I was going to show you how to start some milkweed seeds. Okay, let's do it. Let's do and it. I'm going to teach you how to pretend that we are nature. Okay. We're going to take we our milkweed seeds and um, get them planted. All right. So, first thing, I don't have any props exactly, but you've probably seen milkweed pods. Mm -hmm. After they bloom, yeah. you get the big pod, which then breaks open with the stringy, um, white sort of satiny looking things and each one of those strings there's a seed attached right, to it. Right. And they'll be familiar with that because we have a butterfly garden. Yes. And we actually have some that we in our butterfly garden. Oh, perfect. Um, and they can be a little tricky to harvest just because of all those seeds. Um, a friend of mine, you may know Mary Schmidt, oh, of course I has, <laughs> has given me a, I don't have a, a prop, but um, she showed me a great method where you put them into a brown sack, a little paper bag. You cut a little hole in the bottom and you yeah. shake it and the seeds will fall out and the silky strings will stay in the bag. The thing Mary knows, how about that? Know. She knows good. everything. It's pretty good. Um, so this is what your seeds will look like once you get them out. Yeah. Um, pretty cool looking seeds though. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now it, it happens sometimes that you'll get a whole pod where nothing's viable. Um, wow. And sometimes you can feel the difference. Uh, some seeds you can sort of feel they have substance, really? whereas others you might feel, yes. just feel kind of like paper thin. Um, so a, a lot of it is, you know, when, when you're starting seeds, you might want to grab your pods from a few different places, okay. get your seeds from a few different plants. Um, so in general, we are going to uh, simulate nature here. And in nature, these seeds would fall on the ground and they would go through winter. Okay. And winter is what they need to break their dormancy. So. They're gonna go through a cold winter, and when they start having a few warm-ups in the spring, that's when the seeds are triggered to germinate. Ah, they don't right. want to germinate too soon, or they're gonna be trying to grow in the middle of January. Yeah, we don't want that. And then they're gonna die, yeah. so. Um, so they're very attuned to nature, to the temperature, to the moisture. So we are gonna do our my favorite method for milkweed seeds here at Lichterman okay. is, it's called stratification. Okay, which okay. is? Which is, uh, there's a few different definitions. Okay. Um, it's basically giving your seeds a, a moist period mixed with some, some sort of substrate um, for a length of time. Okay. Um, it can be cold, it can be room temperature, it can be warm. We use cold stratification for almost everything because almost all of our seeds are native okay. and they go through a cold stratification in nature. So we're going to replicate that. Makes sense. That. Makes sense. Um, I like to use sand. Other people use uh, perlite or um, sphagnum moss sometimes. Yeah, so what kind of sand is it? Just this is just uh, sand. like playground sand, okay. I think. Okay. I don't know exactly. Okay. Um, so I'm going to put about a scoop in there. I'm going to put my some of these seeds. I might do a little more sand if I'm going to do all these seeds. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Put our seeds in, and we need to put a little water in there. That's the key. So I'm going to come back here behind oh, you. Sure, sure. And put a little water in. Oh, so it's just a little water. Just a little bit. You want it to be about the consistency of beach sand, oh. sort of the sort of damp beach sand. Um, and then I'm going to mix this all together. The idea would be for every seed to be touching a little bit of wet sand. And 
Pretty easy, right? Yeah, that's pretty easy so far. Once you get used to it, it goes real quick. I can cold stratify things seed after seed after seed in okay. one morning, get a bunch going. Um, very important step is to label. Yeah. And these are Asclepias tuberosa, which is butterfly weed. Yeah, so good. one of my favorite plants. So I'm going to put the name here. And again, botanical name. Yep, botanical name. Asclepius is all the milkweeds. Mm -hmm. uh, and the date. And the date. So um, we want to put the date on here. I don't remember exactly the date, but it's, I don't know. Close. Just put a date. Yeah. yeah, you want to put the date. Uh, and then we put it in the fridge. Okay. A lot of times I also will write uh, maybe four weeks. So I know. Yeah, I was just about to ask you, yeah, so how long? Okay. I, I do know that, you know, milkweeds are usually about four weeks minimum. You can do two, you can do two months, uh, you could do eight weeks too. Okay. Or even longer. So I'll stick these in the fridge, maybe write myself a note on my calendar and <laughs> take them out. Now that when we take them out, and I'll show you this part, a lot of people get confused. They think, how am I going to get all those seeds out of there? Yeah, I was, I was actually just wondering. <laughs> yeah, how, well, this part's great. So you It'd be hard to see, okay. Right. Yeah. So you're just going to pull the sand out. And I am just going to uh, mash it down it on top of mm -hmm. my root trainer. So you don't have to worry about finding your seeds. Ah, okay. And then just like with any seed starting method, we want to keep this moist mm -hmm. on the top. Sure. We have misters here on timers, okay. but if you're doing something at home, just have a spray bottle and mist it multiple times a day. You don't want them to dry out. Okay, don't want to dry out. And after a, a month or two in the fridge, these will probably come up in a week or two. Oh, so it doesn't take long at all? No. Yeah. Um, and that's about it. Okay. A, a lot of the information that we use for these comes from uh, a propagation book that I have. So you can look up any, pretty much any native plant species in mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. and it'll give you step by step, step. when to collect the seed, what to do with it, uh, uh -huh. how long it takes for certain things to happen. Uh, I like that, yeah. And it's really great. So. Good little cheat sheet, I like that. Yeah, it's Step great. by step. So mm -hmm. you have a finished product for us? Oh, like we that? do. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah. All right. All right, and here are, this is a slightly different species, but they are milkweeds. We do the exact same process. Oh, These are common milkweeds. Okay. And this is what we call a root trainer, just a little bit different setup. Same exact uh, okay. thing that we just smushed the sand on top of here. And it took a couple weeks and we have all those little babies. That's pretty good germination rate. Right? Yeah, that's pretty good there. So if somebody's interested in these methods, what do they need to go for information? All right, so when, I'm, when I can't find what I'm looking for in my book or okay. if I don't have this book, right. really this day and age you can Google your species. Okay. So this I would Google Asclepia syriaca propagation. And lots and lots of things are gonna come up on the internet. I tried this, this, this works great, do mm -hmm. this. Um, and you'll start to find different places that you trust more than others. I'm sure. Um, but uh, you'll also notice a lot of these methods are, they, they start to overlap. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll see similarities in some different methods. But uh, the internet is a fantastic source, even for identifying seeds. You know, a lot of people have a hard time <laughs> telling, well, what part of this brown crispy <laughs> thing is the seed? And the internet will show you a very close-up picture of it, so right. you can tell what you're, what you're harvesting. Okay, and I like to throw in there, of course, your local extension service. You know, of course, have information ask about a master gardener. Ask a master gardener. Yeah. And the extension service. Sure, here yeah, we Lots of resources. We have some resources available for you all. We certainly oh, of course. do. All right, well, Jesse, look, we appreciate that. Yeah, thank you much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's talk a little bit about why this pepper plant is wilting. Uh, just a few weeks ago, it was actually doing just fine. Then all of a sudden, the whole plant just wilted. And what usually causes this is a bacterial wilt. Bacterial wilts usually happen because of too much moisture. So what we have to do here is the next time is make sure we correct the drainage problem. Because again, this area is actually poorly drained. So let's correct the drainage area. And we may need to put more organic material into this ground. Build it up a little bit so it will drain a lot better. So again, this is bacteria wilt. And as you can see, the whole plant has wilted. Because this plant has bacteria wilt, 
it cannot be saved. You will have to pull this plant up and throw it away. I wouldn't throw it in the compost pile, I just put it in the trash. All right, Joella, let's talk about iris, all right? Beautiful and iris. iris is the state flower. Iris is the state How flower. About that? Yes, the state they flower. do very well here. Yes, they are beautiful. So, why don't you tell us about iris? Yeah, this are, they they are very regal blooms yeah, in beautiful. the spring, and May is their major month that they bloom here okay. in in our area. Okay. Um, but you know, some of them do rebloom and will bloom again in the fall. And this one here, that's a, a blue and white, it is one of the varieties that I have that reblooms again in the fall. Huh, okay. So there are a few that. of those out there that will rebloom again in the fall, but okay. they put on the best show in the spring. What the heck? Yeah. But they do. Uh, and of course, iris is a Greek word that means rainbow. Ah, I didn't and know that. And okay. of course, the Greek goddess of the rainbow is called iris. <laughs> so that. that's interesting. Uh -huh. um, and of course, some people think that it, it refers to the many colors in the rainbow that iris oh. represents. So that's why they were called, are called iris okay. as a genus. And of course, there are over 200 species wow. around the world of iris. So, you know, they, they, all, they all look similar because they have one thing in common is how their flowers are formed. You have, as you see, they have the three outer leaves uh -huh. that are called falls because they seem to fall down. And then there's three uh, petals on the mm -hmm. inside that are stand up and they're called standards. So when they describe them, they're, they're, they describe the color of the falls and the color of the standards. Sometimes they're the same, sometimes they're different. Okay. And so, it, of course, these beautiful flowers have inspired the French royalty to use them as their fleur de, you know, the, in their fleur de lis, in their, uh, in the, starting in the Middle Ages. Wow. And so it, you saw iris on coins and shields mm -hmm. and their coat of arms. So, uh, and of course, Van Gogh painted his yes. favorite, you know, his iris painting is very famous. Uh -huh. And so, and, and the 25th anniversary flower is the iris also. Oh, okay. So of course, our state of Tennessee, and you know, it's funny, we, I moved here from Illinois and of course, the soils here in Tennessee are very different from the I'm soils sure. Sure. in Illinois, <laughs> let alone the climate. Right. And so my mother brought along iris, uh -huh. and she had them in little bags, and we had a little area of dirt, and of course, you know, our, this didn't look like the dirt we were used to. Right. <laughs> so my mother said, well, they're either gonna die in these bags or they're gonna die in this soil. So uh -huh. we planted them, but you know what? They did better than they ever did in Illinois because wow. they love the soil right. here. Right. And it is, and then we found out it was the state flower and we're like, oh, wow. And, and they, you can, you can just literally throw some of these rhizomes on the ground and they will root and take, take root and, and live. That's good. Uh, so they, they love our soils here and they do very well in Tennessee. And there's a lot of different right. kinds and we're gonna go okay. over some of them. Um, first we have the Iris cristata. Cristata. Okay. The dwarf crested iris, it is only three to six inches tall. That's all? No, yeah, it's just, it's very short. Small. It's one of the first to bloom in the spring too. But it usually plant, they sell the bulbs or the rhizomes in the, uh, the, the fall and you plant them in the fall and they come and bloom in the spring. And okay. they will naturalize because they are native to this part of the country. Okay. And in fact, they are, are native uh, up to Ohio too. and and in the south midwest and southeast and of course if they find the right place they will multiply okay. and get bigger and larger clumps of them in the same area oh, okay and so they're very they're usually in the blue family and lavenders and things like that um they of course like sun and well-drained soil <laughs> well-drained soil yeah okay all right yeah and, and well, we're, as we go through the iris, you'll notice some like well drained, and some like, and some are drought tolerant, and some like wet areas. Oh, wow, okay. But this one likes well drained okay. soil. Next is the iris hybrida, the okay. Louisiana iris, also native to the South and to the Mississippi Valley from Ohio on down. Okay. So it's a, it got, they have very large showy flowers, but they're going to be tall, like two to three feet tall. Wow. Okay. They will also bloom later in the, in the spring. Um, very airy, easy to care for, and because of the ease of care of the Louisiana iris, they are very popular all around the world. Oh. So they, have, they like sun again. 
What? Moist but well-drained soil. Moist. So they can get wet, but then they like to dry out before mm -hmm. they get wet again. Right. So they like to they like to be, have well-drained soil, and but they're really not particular about soil type. So that's why they are very popular for many countries and besides us here. And they're native. They're <laughs> okay. native yeah, for they us. Yeah, work here. Right, right. They're native for us. Okay. And of course, there are um, a few others. The, there's a, the, okay. the iris pseudochorus yeah. and the iris versicolor. That's the yellow flag and the blue flag iris, and both of them like wet conditions. You can put them near ponds, and they don't they aren't particular about their rhizomes being out exposed. Okay, okay. And uh, then there's the Siberian iris, which is native to Europe and Central Asia. Caesar's brother is probably the most famous blue <laughs> of that. Okay. Um, it's two to three feet tall. And of course, the iris tectorum, the roof iris, and it's called roof iris because it's native to Japan and to China, where it used to live on thatched roofs in that country. Oh, okay. But it can take a lot of drought. Think about it on a yeah, roof. roof. Right. So, and next is what is the bearded iris, iris hybrida, the bearded iris. Okay. This is what most people think of when they think of iris, but there are many other kinds. They bloom in the spring, and it's best to divide them in July, August, and September. And you want to wait. To reestablish them, you want to give them at least four to six weeks mm -hmm. to reestablish in the soil before the frost comes. Okay. So that's why they said those three months are good okay. for, for dividing them. What happens is they'll bloom, and then where they're sitting, they're going to get energy to bloom again. Then you cut them off and divide right. them, and then they'll, you, they'll be more likely to bloom wherever you're planting them. Okay, I got you. That's, and, of course, Makes you want to get... You want to get a, a large, you want to set them about 12 inches apart. Here's one I've dug up. And the larger area you have for the rhizome, the more likely it's going to bloom the next year. Like this one came off of it also. But this rhizome is not much rhizome left. There's some roots. This will still grow. Okay. But there's not much rhizome. This probably will not bloom the first year. It'll have to get produce a better rhizome to be able to bloom. And when you... It's a pretty good root system. Pretty good root system. Yeah. And this one's a... This, the, the rhizomes are all different sizes. This is, happens to be a much larger one. And you'll notice the roots are on the bottom. And that's what you plant in the soil. Okay. But you really want this exposed because they like to have sun on the rhizome for the bearded iris especially. Okay. A lot of the other iris you don't have to, but the, for the bearded, bearded you do. Okay. Um, and if you are going to plant these, say you divide this and you see how large this is, well it's already got the energy that it needs in July, in August and September for blooms next year, so you want to cut off uh -huh. this foliage Look at that. Okay. because you're going to plant this in the ground and, and if you go to the Iris Society website, they've got a really good picture of this, but it's, it's nice to build up a little small area and you see the roots get spread out all over it. Uh -huh. And then you just can cover it up, just the roots. And that one likes well-drained soils, this right? This likes well-drained soil and likes that, that rhizome exposed. Exposed, okay. But you see how the, the roots were all fanned right. out? And, and it sits there, but oh, it's not sitting. Well, Sometimes you can get <laughs> landscape fabric uh, pins or just some kind of wire and you can huh. stick it down here okay. and anchor it so it'll stay and get rooted and then in a few months, in a few weeks, you can just take the stakes out and it'll be rooted there. Okay. Wow, how about that? But, but the, the, try to keep the rhizome exposed. It has to be exposed, okay. And a lot of times... How, how much watering then? Well, you're going to have to water this when it because okay. the roots are very new and on the very top of the All surface. Right. So you want to make sure you water it and keep it moist. Keep it moist, okay. But don't keep it wet. But okay. just just moist and until it gets rooted, and then you can take the wires off and then you'll have another one. And you're supposed to space them about 12 inches apart because they will get very crowded. Okay. Before we have to end, any major diseases or insect pests we need to be concerned about? No major diseases That's or pests good. with it. None. Beautiful plants. Gorgeous. Thanks, Joella. Yeah, it's a state flower. State flower. All right, we appreciate that good information. The beautiful plants, which are yours, right? Those are mine. Hey, good job, good job. Thank you much.
cabbage is one of our cool season spring crops here in the Mid-South, but one of the things I really like about it is just because it's ready and it's headed doesn't mean you have to pick it right away. You can wait. So right now it's uh, early August and we still have some cabbage that's here from this spring. So I'm just gonna go ahead and cut that at this point. Take some work with the pruners here to get it. But there's my cabbage. Now, because it is a little older uh, and it's been out here a little while, you might have some damage from uh, various cabbage eating insects and worms. So you may need to take off a couple of the outside leaves to get into the middle where you don't have that damage anymore. Uh, this one happens, looks like it's pretty good. And so we can just take this in, wash it off and, and eat it for dinner. All right, here's our Q&A segment. Y'all ready? Ready. These ready. are great questions. All right, here's our first viewer email. What do you recommend for deer protection for your flower garden? This is Donnie from Orangeburg, South Carolina. So Mary, I'm coming to you about this one. So what do you think? Okay, so you can always look for what's labeled deer resistant okay. plants. Okay. However, However, if a deer is hungry, <sighs> it will still eat those plants labeled deer resistant. Sure. So really, one of the best ways to protect your garden from deer is fencing. Mm -hmm. And you have to keep in mind that deer can jump at least six to seven feet. That's yeah, crazy. Probably man. higher. So yeah. you're looking at a, a, at least a six foot high fence. Yeah. Six foot high fence. Yeah. Uh, anything you want to add to that? Jessica? Oh, well, when I was a kid, my mom put uh, the compact CDs, you know, the old CDs. <laughs> yeah. She would hang them around her garden and right. as the light hit off of them, they would, I guess, scare away some deer. Yeah, like a deterrent or something like that. Yeah, so they so can jump pretty nice. high. Mm -hmm. I can tell you, you know, at the Agri Center where our office is located, they use an eight foot fence, mm -hmm. right? Eight foot fence, uh, some of that fencing, electric fencing, mm -hmm. of course, it deters them. Um, so that's the best way to do it. Exclusion yes. fencing yeah. is going to be the best way to try to, you know, keep deer out of your garden. Now, look, we've all heard about repellents and things like right. that. I mean, some of those are hit or miss. I've heard the human hair. I'm pretty sure you heard that before. Mm -hmm. Soap is mm -hmm. something I've heard. Mothballs. Uh, but understand those things are going to be outside. Yes. Right. So they're just temporary. Exactly. Right? So exclusion fencing, eight feet tall, mm -hmm. uh, eight foot tall fencing is probably going to be your best bet. I agree. It's going agree. to be your best bet. Yeah, so Danny, good luck with that. We appreciate that question. All right, here's our next viewer email. I see tiny red bugs on the pavers and stones around my flower beds. What are they? And this is Walter from Memphis, Tennessee. So let's see if we can help Walter out, right? Because I've actually seen these little tiny red bugs around my garden, right? Yes. Clover mites. Yeah, totally harmless. Yeah, um, harmless. Not actually an insect, they belong to the arachnid family. Mm, okay. um, so not a spider, but still in that same group and harmless, so just um, part of the habitat there. Yeah, they're not a big problem, right? They right. live in your lawn. Mm -hmm. Of course, they multiply you know, pretty quick when the weather starts to warm up. So you start to see them in April or May. Uh, they're plant suckers. Yeah, so they're just sucking oh. plant juice. That's pretty much what they're doing. They're not gonna cause any major damage or any harm or anything like that. They don't bite and you. They're not gonna bite, right? right. They're not gonna bite, that's a good point. Um, so no need for the, the pesticides. No. No, no need. Right. Probably gonna be killing off some of your beneficial that's insects right. too if that's you right. use that. All right, so uh, no pesticides, Walter. Yeah, if you need to, get the hose out. Sure. Jet stream of water. We'll get them out of the off. area. That'd be fine. Yeah. All right, so thank you for that question, Walter. We appreciate that. All right, here's our next viewer email. I have noticed an odd ceiling that appears each late spring or early summer on the north side of my property. I do not know what it is. It is not like anything I have intentionally planted in my garden. Curious if this is a garden friend or foe. Thanks in advance for your feedback. And this is April from Carrierville, Tennessee. Thank you for that picture, April. Um, so the old morning glory. So mm -hmm. what do y'all know about morning glory? Well, they're, they're very pretty. Yeah, they are pretty. <laughs> and the pollinators will come to them. Mm -hmm. um, they're not native, but um, they're easy to, to keep in your garden. They're easy to, to have. You don't have to do anything with them, and they're very beautiful. Yeah. So. I would say the only thing um, to keep in mind is if it's kind of a, a raised bed or something uh, like that, 
it is going to be competing with what you really oh, want point. there. Good so um, you might want to pull it out, even if it's not really harmful. It, it could be, you know, it's competing for those same mm -hmm. water nutrient resources in the soil. Uh, that's good. Uh, heart shaped leaves, you know, beautiful leaves, beautiful yes. flowers, mm -hmm. you know, kind of shaped like trumpets. Uh, you were talking about the pollinators. Not to be confused with bindweed. Which you definitely want to get rid of. Yeah, you yes. want to get rid of bindweed, mm -hmm. right? Because it has a robust root system. It's yes. considered to be invasive. Mm -hmm. uh, so you definitely uh, don't want the bindweed. But the morning glory, it's fine. It's yeah. fine. So there you go, April. We thank you for that. Yeah, leave those for those pollinators, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that'll be good. All right. So Jesse, Mary, those fine. Thank you much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org and the mailing address is familyplot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. If you want to learn more about collecting seeds or anything else we talked about today, head on over to familyplotgarden.com. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.